this video, I'll be building my own version of a classic coffee table game called a Labyrinth. Many of us are familiar with some variation of this game being played with a wooden maze and a ball bearing, which by tilting the board can be navigated through the maze while avoiding traps along the way. My goal for this project was to find an easy way to reproduce this game with a minimal amount of tools and materials, and a customizable game surface. Coating the maze in hydrophobic paint allows a drop of water to take the place of a ball bearing, which might seem like a simple gimmick, but in fact it makes a significant difference in how the game is played. A water drop changes shape like an amoeba, it bounces off the hydrophobic walls like rubber, and when it falls through a trap, it's possible for some of the drop to survive, granting an extra life in the game if you choose to allow that in the rules. To build this game, I started with a trip to the hardware store to buy some pegboard. This has pre-drilled holes that can be used to attach various pieces of the maze. The holes also double as traps, which will save us some drilling. In order to end up with an internal grid of 10x10 holes, a square of pegboard should be cut that is 12x12, because one row on each side will be covered by the outside walls. The borders of the maze I cut from half-inch square dowels, which were held in place with a bead of hot glue, neatly covering the outermost holes. Now the interior walls are made with smaller square dowels, just large enough in diameter to cover the holes in the board, in this case one quarter inch. Round dowels of the same diameter fit in these holes, so they can be used to make pegs, which once glued to the sections of square dowel will hold them in place. To cut a large number of these wood pegs, it's a good idea to make a simple cutting jig from a scrap piece of wood. This is done by drilling a hole that the dowel will fit through, then using a fine tooth saw to cut straight down across this hole. Now the dowel can be pushed through in consistent increments, and the saw will cut it the exact same way every time. Five minutes later, and I had all the pegs I needed. Likewise for the square dowel, I'll need to cut a lot of pieces, so it's worthwhile to make a jig. This time I just glued a few sections left over from the maze border onto a scrap block of wood, with room for the smaller dowel to fit between them. I finish by again making a cut down the middle. Now I won't have to worry about the dowels wiggling around as I try to cut tiny pieces with a large unwieldy saw. There are many different approaches you could take to designing the layout of this game. The simplest is to make the starting point in a corner, measuring a piece of square dowel to box it in. Placing two pegs in the board where I want this dowel to rest, a dot of white glue on each is all it takes to secure the new wall. I've cut the round pegs to be slightly longer than the pegboard is thick, so the walls are held above the surface as the glue dries. In this way the walls won't stick to the board permanently if any excess glue seeps out. As I decided how I wanted this labyrinth to work its way around the board, I initially cut the pieces and set them in place without gluing them onto pegs. Pieces can be placed on an angle, with the ends trimmed with a razor blade or sanded with an emery board, to match up to other pieces. In this way, more interesting designs can be laid out. Some pathways can get quite narrow, but a drop of water will still be able to squeeze through. To make this game more challenging, it's possible to use a razor blade to connect some of the traps together into larger holes. But this final design turned out reasonably challenging in the end, especially when using a large drop of water that barely fits through the passages. Once I was satisfied with the layout, the pegs were added, and the pieces glued in place. After the glue has had time to dry, the next step will be to apply the hydrophobic coating. For reasons that will become clear in a moment, the board and the maze walls should be painted separately. I took out the pieces and placed them into a spare section of pegboard, so it would be easy to remember how to put them back again. Hydrophobic coatings are available at most hardware stores and usually require a two-part painting process. The base coat is painted first, and I made sure to spray from all four angles to be sure it was even. The walls of the maze are painted in the same way, it's just a bit more tricky to get the paint into every area. After 30 minutes of dry time, I apply the second part of the hydrophobic coating, repeating the same process of spraying from all four angles. This dries a milky white, and as I move on to spraying the walls, you can see how much less even the coating is on the underlying pegboard. This is why my original board was painted separately.
After drying, the frame for the maze is brought back to the workbench and flipped upside down. The simplest way I thought of to be able to tilt the maze while it's set on a table was to glue a spring in each of the four corners. The original Labyrinth game uses a pair of articulating wood frames and knobs to tilt the table, but the springs work very well as a more simple option. Now all that needs to be done is to transfer the wall segments back to the board, which now press all the way in because the board is elevated off the workbench, and the game is complete. To play, I start by putting a drop of water in the corner, and with both hands on the board, the drop can be moved in any direction. It has very little friction on the playing surface compared to a ball bearing, which can allow for very precise control when moving slowly, but if you go too fast, any mistakes are amplified. Finishing the game quickly is quite difficult. If you do make it all the way to the end, the game can also be played in reverse. One thing that could be interesting to try is to build a maze where the drop is split into two pieces along the way, which have to be navigated individually until joining together again later on. If you have other ideas for how to improve this game, let me know in the comments. I'd like to hear them. It's good to once again have Brilliant.org as the sponsor for this video. I like talking about Brilliant because they align so well with one of my primary goals for this channel, to make science, math, and education in general interesting, as it should be. Being taught in a classroom is a good thing, but one major problem for a lot of people is that the classroom creates a disconnect between education and the real world. So the topics feel irrelevant, which makes them boring. But science and math do have real-world, everyday applications. We're just not trained to see them. Brilliant designs their educational courses to help your mind connect these seemingly abstract educational topics with tangible things we're familiar with. They teach math through games and puzzles, so not only do you learn how math can help you when playing games, but you remember the information better because you're having fun learning it. Once basic concepts click in your mind to solve practical problems, suddenly you can understand the value of learning even more. And science, math, logic, they become interesting. So check out Brilliant through the link I have in the video description below. And if you'd like to try them out and would like a membership, you can get 20% off by using that link, brilliant.org forward slash Nighthawk. I hope you enjoyed this video. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time. That's what you get for dropping it, bud. Where did it even go? Where'd it go? Oh, there it is. Here we go.